Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In a dramatic turn of events, I'm leaning more and more towards wildcarding this week in game week 28. And even if I decide not to wildcard, which I'll discuss in this video, I still think a lot of people are looking at it. So in today's video, we'll have a complete guide on what your team should look like for wildcard 28 in my humble opinion. If you do enjoy today's video and you get any use out of it, please smash that like button. And if you're new around here, make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So I know yesterday you would have probably watched my video where I spoke about taking this big minus eight, not wild carding, not free hitting and just getting through it. But I think you could probably tell by the way I was talking. I'm not happy with my team. I have injuries all over the place. The players that I actually have in 29 aren't particularly good. And without any transfers, I'm currently sat here with only one double game week player in Solanke for double game week 28. And so... I am very, very tempted to wildcard. And throughout Thursday and then going into Friday, I'm looking at this wildcard more and more and thinking, no, it's not perfect. And we'll look at a second. There are lots of cons of wildcarding this early. But I'm also looking at it and thinking there is a lot of upside to be had over the next few weeks. And if things do play out okay... I don't think a wildcard 28 is too far away from what you might find around 30 and 31. So in this first section, I'm going to look at the pros and cons of a wildcard. Then we'll briefly look at when else might you play your wildcard and what might your strategy look like. And then we will move on to the team. Of course, you can feel free to just skip to the team part. But I would watch this because I think it is incredibly relevant as to how I'm setting up this wildcard 28 team. So what are the pros of a wildcard in 28? Well, the first thing is you don't have to take lots of hits. I'm currently lining up either a minus 8 or a minus 12 in 28 if I choose not to wildcard. And then I'm probably looking at a minimum of a minus 4 in game week 29 to probably field either 9 or 10 players. Let's say I was trying to field 11. We would be looking at 16 points probably worth of hits over the next two weeks. And then going into game week 30, you then wouldn't have to take a hit and then you could wildcard in 31. That's assuming obviously you're wildcarding in 31 and not saving it. But I think you're going to have to take probably at least four to eight points worth of hits over the next couple. And even then, you don't have an optimal team for 28 and you don't have an optimal team for 29. So lots of hits, the wild card would help you there. The second thing is it does allow you to attack both 28 and 29. I've said equally well here. Maybe that isn't true, as we'll see when we move on to the draft, but you can attack an upcoming double. And because Luton double in 28 and play in 29, and there are other good players that we'll discuss, like the likes of Jared Bowen and Hyung Min Son that have good fixtures, you can attack a double game week and cover a big blank game week with the same wild card, with the same chip. So you don't have to take hits, you don't have to free hit, just the one wild card will help you attack both of those. You will gain extra fixtures. So I've said here as many as 10 extra fixtures. At the moment, I've only got Solanke. If I gain five more doublers, I am gaining five extra fixtures there. And if I gain three or four of further players in game week 29, I'm gaining as few as eight or nine extra fixtures across the next two weeks. Let's say that it's 10 fixtures that it would be for a lot of people. That is 20 appearance points you're gaining. If you then add that to the amount of hits that you're taking, let's say, I don't know, conservatively 12 points worth of hits, I am saving 32 points by wildcarding by getting extra appearance points and by reducing the amount of hits I take, not even including the fact that I then have players that have two or three bites of the cherry in comparison to one. So I just think there is so much extra ability to gain points over the next two if you wildcard. You can tell I am I am slightly leaning towards wildcard and passionately talking about why the wildcard's so good. The other reason is we already know which teams are doubling in 34 and 37. I want to emphasize here, we know which teams will be doubling because it's the teams that are not playing in 29. We just don't know which weeks they're wildcarding, which I'll discuss in a second is a con of wildcarding now. I don't know what 34 and 37 will look like. I don't know which teams will fall where. So we know which teams are doubling. We know which teams we probably have to load up on, but it's not a completely clear picture. The other reason is this will allow me to save my free hit in 29. If I wildcard this week, there is the potential that you wildcard 28 free hit 29, but likely it means I can save my free hit for game week 34. So I don't think you'll come massively unstuck by wildcarding now because you've got the free hit to cover either 34 or 37, depending on when you see fit. The other reason is Bournemouth players could be useful later on. It looks less likely now that they'll double in 34, but they could even double in 35 or 36, or they could double in 37. We don't know now, but Bournemouth players at some point could be very useful. So loading up on three Bournemouth not only gives you three doublers this week, but it probably gives you three further doublers in either 34, 35, 36 or 37. So I think Bournemouth could be very useful for that reason. And then the final thing is, and this is one of the key things leading me to it, 
is you can just deal with injuries and other issues in your team. I can sell the likes of Richarlison, who doesn't look like he'll be available. Pedro Porro, Pau Torres, they've been causing me issues for such a long time. I can sort out Charlie Taylor, who, let's be honest, there's no issue with Charlie Taylor, but I might be able to get a slightly stronger option in that sort of fifth defender spot. So, lots and lots of potential pros of the Wildcard 28, but it is not a perfect week to Wildcard, which is why I'm still hesitant. There are lots of issues with Wildcarding in 28. The first being, you are technically, I say stuck, and I've put in quotation marks because it's not awful, but you are stuck with three Luton and three Bournemouth, assuming you really attack double game week 28. The three Bournemouth, I don't think is a massive issue. And someone like a Doughty, I also don't think is a huge issue. If you also chuck Kaminsky in there, maybe it's not an issue, right? You tuck Kaminsky on your bench, you put play Doughty when he's got a decent fixture, and your three Bournemouth could be useful. But for most people, they don't want to have six of their 15 spots. You've only got nine spots out of that outside of Luton and Bournemouth. So no, that's not ideal. I've actually looked at a wildcard 31. I think I would have as many as nine players from Arsenal, City and Liverpool, a minimum of seven or eight. If you wildcard this week, you're going to have a maximum of three, I would imagine. So you are almost potentially six players behind. And not only are you six players behind, you're six players behind from three of the best teams in the league. I wouldn't have Salah this week, probably. Maybe not Haaland. You wouldn't have Foden. You maybe only have two Arsenal maximum. You then don't have the likes of Darwin Nunez or Virgil van Dijk, who you might have on a game week 31 wildcard. So... The 28 wildcard, whilst it still looks fine in game week 31, you can see this in a second, but it still looks good in those weeks, is certainly not close to what I would say is the optimal wildcard team around that week. The next thing to note is there is an international break between game week 29 and 30. International breaks are always chaos. Let's say you build a perfectly good team this week, you get through 28, yay, you gain loads of points, you get a really good team for blank game week 29, and then you pick up four injuries in the international break, you are going to be kicking yourself. Because not only are you six players behind the wildcard 31 probably, you're also then potentially another three or four transfers behind because you've got other injuries to deal with. So whilst it looks okay now, you never know what the, the landscape is going to look like in two or three weeks. The other thing is if you sell the likes of Haaland and Foden, you are losing value on them. I'll add Saka in there because I've looked at some wildcard drafts and I've run wildcard drafts and some models and lots of them recommend removing the likes of Saka. I wouldn't recommend re removing Saka. I'd probably keep him. But if you remove Saka, Watkins and these other players and you want to bring them back in, you're losing value on a lot of them. The other thing is, as I've just spoken about, uh, we don't know the exact schedule for 34 and 37. So we know which teams will double for the remainder of the season, but we don't know where those doubles will fall for some teams. So that isn't particularly useful because if you're planning to free hit 34 and bench boost 37, it would be much more useful to know which teams definitely double in 37. And then the final thing is it is difficult to sort out other issues that might arise in your team when you're essentially banking low or booking in loads of transfers, I should say. So the likes of Salah and Haaland, if you don't wildcard them in this week, you need to plan to get them. So I'll discuss in a second my transfer plans if I rock this wildcard 28 would be along the lines of Salah in 30, Haaland in 31, Foden in 30. Like you're almost booking in transfers for every single week because you need to get back to this point where you have a slightly stronger team. But like I said, especially with the international break and other issues, you also might have to deal with other issues of injury rotation and players just not performing. So when you're booking in transfers ahead of time, you, you're assuming and hoping that the rest of the team that you've picked hold for that period of time as well. So you, you you need to get a bit lucky, I guess is what I should be saying here, is that it's not just about having a well carefully crafted plan. It's also about getting lucky with injuries, rotation, and other issues in your team. So whilst I'm now going to, in a second, present a wildcard 28 team, and I'm very tempted myself, I don't think this is a particularly brilliant strategy with no flaws. I think there are lots of issues with this, but I think if you are sat there right now with your team, You've got very few doublers in 28. You're maybe looking at around five or six players maximum for 29. You either have already used your free hit or don't want to use it. And or you have other issues in your team such as injury rotation. And you just don't think it's a particularly optimal team for you. I don't think it's an awful idea to wildcard in 28. And that's why I'm currently considering it. Let me know if I've done a good job there of pros and cons. And if you can think of anything else that I haven't mentioned. So very briefly, before we look at the wildcard 28 team, and we are going to get there eventually, I thought I would just very, very briefly run through the four strategies that I can see today. Strategy three and four were the two that I was more likely to run with recently, which is wildcard 31, free hit 34, bench boost 37. I still may do this. I might not play the wildcard, by the way, but I'm very tempted. That was my traditional strategy that I've always been planning to have. I just feel like my team is struggling at the moment. Strategy four 
is then the one that is also popular, which is free hit 29. And because you're free hitting in 29, and assuming your team is okay outside of that, you can probably delay the wild card until 34, 35, 36 to then attack a bench boost in 37. So strategy three and four are the two most popular at the moment. But with strategy one and two, you can see they are the two wild card 28 strategies. I think the more popular wild card strategy and the one that I would be going with is wild carding this week, but still saving the free hit for 34 and the bench boost for 37. So the only way strategy one differs from strategy three is I'm just wild carding three weeks early. Four weeks early. Four weeks early. So rather than 31, I'm, I'm uh, wildcarding in 28. So the rest of the plan stays roughly the same. The other way you could attack this is wildcard 28, free hit 29 still, and bench boost 37. This would change the draft because in your wildcard 28, you probably wouldn't have West Ham assets. You wouldn't have probably any Aston Villa assets. You would have fewer Spurs assets potentially. Basically, you wouldn't have all of the assets that play in 29 or you wouldn't have to force them into your team. Maybe you would only have two Luton as opposed to three Luton. And you could keep the likes of Foden, Haaland. You could bring Salah in as well. You basically set your team up to look better from 30 onwards, but you are losing that free hit that could potentially be useful in 34. So the wildcard draft that I'm showing today is a strategy one wildcard draft. It's a wildcard 28, free hit 34, bench boost 37. But I certainly don't dislike strategy two, assuming that you think 34 will be underwhelming and you think you can maybe navigate without the free hit. Obviously, if you've already used your free hit, then you are doing neither strategy one or strategy two. You're just building a wildcard 28 and you just have to accept that it might be a little bit more difficult for you to navigate game week 34. So guys, let's jump into looking at this wildcard 28 draft. And this is definitely subject to change. I've given this about three or four hours of thought already, though. I've done a lot of planning on Thursday evening because I'm very, very tempted myself. And I wanted to see, is it actually viable? Having planned and looked at it, yes, it's certainly viable. But it obviously depends on which FA, which way the FA Cup quarterfinal results go as to which teams will double in 34 and which teams will double in 37. And also when the Premier League decide to reschedule these fixtures. So I don't yet know exactly how viable it is, but it looks pretty viable. Above my head, you can see a box with a, a question mark. The reason for that is I don't want to show the transfer plans until the end where I've actually shown you the entire team. The reason I've got transfer plans in there is you might look at this team and think it looks a mess, but I just want to show you it's only a few transfers away from getting to a very good spot. And I don't have, spoiler alert, Salah or Haaland in this draft. And I think it's important to work out a way to get both Salah and Haaland. I don't think you want your team to be in a position where you can only get one and you're like, oh, I don't care. I'll work out how to get the other one later down. That doesn't work. And you can, you can see already just the players that are on the screen. I've had to make some serious sacrifices in budget to make sure that there is an easy enough way to get both Salah and Haaland back very, very soon. So this draft currently has 13.6 million in the bank. And I need pretty much all of that to get those two big boys back in. And I think you will struggle to build a wildcard draft similar to mine if your team value isn't very good. My team value isn't perfect by any means, but it's certainly strong. And there aren't many obvious positions in this wildcard draft to downgrade. The only places I can see are probably in the midfield area or you don't downgrade now. And then when you want to bring Salah and Haaland back in, you accept that it might have to be you sacrifice someone like a Kyung Min Son. But I'll explain all of that when we get to it. But this isn't a draft where I think there's lots of wiggle room in, in where you could make up the money. I'll start with the goalkeepers. I've had seven or eight different goalkeepers in my wildcard drafts that I've been tinkering with tonight. I've currently got Kaminsky and Petrovic in there at the moment. I think the only key things I, I definitely want is I want one of Kaminsky or Neto because I want to attack the double this week. It's one of the advantages of wildcarding in 28. So I know I want a double game week goalkeeper. And I also know I want a goalkeeper for game week 29. So I need someone that has a fixture that week. And I also think I also want a, a goalkeeper that has pretty good fixtures from 30 onwards. A keeper that not only can make saves and has clean sheet potential, but has the fixtures to really attack. And I think wildcarders might potentially look to have themselves. So this combination that I've got currently here kind of has all of that. So Kaminsky obviously doubles this week and plays in 29. So Kaminsky covers the first two parts of what I need with a goalkeeper. The issue with Kaminsky is I don't really want him beyond that. And he's not going to double in 37. And I'm going to be bench boosting in 37. So that is immediately a transfer I'm booking in to replace Kaminsky with another goalkeeper. Neto, who's not currently in here, doubles this week. But remember, he doesn't play in 29, but he looks like he could potentially double in 37. And if not 37, he has at least one further double this season, whether that be 34, 35, 36 or 37. So Neto is really good because he's got a better double this week, playing for arguably a better defense and also has a further double. My issue with Neto 
is if I put Neto in instead of Kaminsky, I then have to have another blank game week goalkeeper. So I've looked at the likes of Vicario, who's probably up there as one of my favourites. I could also go for Kaminsky, but I doubt I would. Ariola is obviously a safe bet. And then Flecken is the other popular one that I think rotates quite nicely with Neto. But like I said, I like some of the other goalkeepers. And as you can see at the moment, I've got Petrovic on the bench. I think Petrovic will keep his place. Let me know down below if you disagree. But by all accounts, I think he's been pretty decent since he's come in. And if not Petrovic, I actually think David Raya is really good as well. Gives you an Arsenal defender. Locks in an Arsenal spot. And again, you will want Arsenal players from 31 onwards. So the reason that I've gone for Kaminsky over Neto at the moment at least, but I could well change this is I actually like Petrovic and Raya. And I've gone back and forth on who I want. But the fact that I've already got Gabriel in the team, as we'll discuss in a second, I've gone for Petrovic just to cover another defence. And Chelsea's fixtures are really strong from 30 onwards. They've got Burnley in 30 themselves. So Kaminsky and Petrovic cover me for the next two in Kaminsky. And then from 30 onwards, I just play Petrovic pretty much every week. So if it's not Kaminsky and Petrovic, I think the combination completely changes. And I would go with Neto and Flecken. Because Neto covers me this week, Flecken covers me in 29, Neto then covers me from 30 to 34, and then Flecken covers me after that. They actually have a really nice rotation between the two of them. So I think my goalkeeper pairing, if I am to wildcard, which I'm still not sure about, I would go Kaminsky and Petrovic or Raya, or it would be Neto and Flecken. Hopefully that is clear. If you're on a wildcard yourself, let me know what your goalkeeper combination is. In the defence... I've, again, struggled a little bit with this, but I'll go through the ones that I've had in every single draft. Doughty has been in every single draft because I'm not free hitting in 29 and he's got a double this week. I don't need to keep saying that because I've said that in every video this week. We love Doughty. Really, really nice option. I've also had Zabani in every single draft as well because I want to have at least one Bournemouth defender this week for the double once again. But also, as I said, from 30 onwards, I actually quite like Bournemouth's fixtures. So Zabani feels like a really safe bet and he's very, very cheap at 4.42. I've also had, in every single draft, a Spurs defender. I am recording this before the press conference update around Pedro Porro. If he's available, maybe I decide to keep him. But again, based on budget being very tight at the moment, I quite like the idea of just having new doggy in the team. So I think Doughty, Zabani, and new doggy would be in pretty much all of my wildcard drafts. The final two spots I've sort of gone back and forth on. At the moment, I've got another Bournemouth defender in Kerkes, but that's because I've not got Neto. If I have Neto, then Kerkes will become someone else. But... Is Kirkes fully nailed? No, but as you'll see with my transfer plans in a second, I might sell him in 29 anyway. It may well be a one-week pun. And given that Lloyd Kelly still doesn't look like he's back anytime soon, and even once he is back, Lloyd Kelly could play centre-back for Bournemouth, I think Kirkes should serve me absolutely fine for 28. And then maybe if I need him, he might still even be okay for 30 and 31. So I think Kirkes is a really nice option to double up with Zabani to give me basically an entire backline of doublers. And then the fifth defender I've got is Gabriel. Again, I've gone back and forth on this because apart from this week, Gabriel's then got the blank, which doesn't help me. He's then got Man City, which doesn't help me. And even when the fixtures improve a little bit for Arsenal, Arsenal are the best defence in the league. But some of those games, I'm like, they look okay on paper, but clean sheet wise, I'm less sure. So I don't think Arsenal defence is as essential as it has been, but I also think Arsenal are brilliant. So I still quite like the idea of Gabriel. What I've gone back and forth on is at the moment, I've got Petrovic and Gabriel in this draft. I've also looked at the idea of Gusto and Raya. I don't think it's too dissimilar in pricing, but Raya's obviously a, a obviously brilliant keeper, makes saves as well. But Gusto has a decent amount of attacking threat and he's very cheap to sit on the bench too. And we don't think that Rhys James will be back anytime soon. So I think Gusto's minutes should be fairly secure. But I just think Petrovic and Gabriel, a little bit more nailed for minutes in combination. And Gabriel has been so exceptional. I've got money tied up in him. It seems like a crazy idea to sell Gabriel unless I'm very, very sure about wanting Gusto and Raya instead. So that is the current backline situation. Double Bournemouth, double Luton, Gabriel, you doggy, and then Petrovic on the bench. Like I said, there are a few different things I've been thinking about. I know a lot of people will say, oh, you've got double Bournemouth and double loot and that looks absolutely horrific. I know, but I mean, who else is going to outscore them? They've got, at least they've got two fixtures each. We are looking at just through appearance points, 16 points from that back line. Yes, they might concede and get less than that, but at least they're getting more appearance points than other defenders. And defenders have been so disappointing this year. I back them to do okay. So that's the back line. Let's move on to the four-man midfield. 
So moving on to the four-man midfield and also the fifth midfielder on the bench, and it does look fairly template, and I actually already own three of these players in my current team, and many of you may already own four of them, but I think Parmesan Saka, they speak for themselves. A lot of people obviously already have these players. I will just say, obviously, Palmer and Saka don't have a fixture in game week 29, but it's not all about game week 29. This is not a free hit draft for 29, so I have to also pick players that look good from 30 onwards, and with Chelsea and Arsenal's fixtures and the fact that they will have another double game week this season. Chelsea have two further double game weeks this season. I think it is worthwhile having both Palmer and Saka in my team. So for that reason, I'm going to be having the two of them. Regardless, they're both on penalties. Both have home fixtures this week. Perfectly happy having the two. And then Son obviously serves you incredibly well because he has a good fixture this week, in my opinion, for him. He also then has a good fixture in 29 against Fulham and an even better fixture in 30 against Luton. I may well sell Hyung Min Son as we move towards sort of game week 33 onwards. Son may be the one that's sacrificed in my team, but for the time being, I don't see any reason to sell Hyung Min Son and to not have him in the wildcard draft. And then the addition here is Jared Bowen into the midfield, who I don't currently own in my actual team. Bowen's got Burnley this week. He's got a decent fixture against Villa, who have been conceding chances recently in 29. And then if you need him in 30, he plays against a very shaky Newcastle defence. But for a lot of people, I think Bowen will become Salah in 30 or 31. So I don't think that Bowen spot is particularly long-term. But Bowen serves you very well over the next couple. And Burnley at home is an excellent entry point for Jared Bowen. And then I've got Alanga as the fifth midfielder. With my wildcard, I don't go different for the sake of it. But if I'm wildcard, I don't want to wildcard into a template and just pick highly owned players. And my team is, to be honest, quite still still quite template, this wildcard team. I just like a spicy pick every now and again. And Alanga is that for me. Really good fixtures. He's got Luton in game week 29. And then I know against my double Luton defense is not ideal. But he's got Luton in 29 and then Palace in 30. Brighton this week, if you wanted to play him, Brighton have just lost 4-0. I think it was 4-0. I was looking at 80 minutes. It was 4-0. They lost pretty badly to Roma in Europe. They are not defending particularly well. So you could even play him this week. But Alanga's data over the last five or six has been exceptionally strong. The other people that I've looked at in that spot, Gibbs White, but slightly more expensive. And his data isn't great. All you get with Gibbs White for me over Alanga is maybe slightly more secure minutes, but also penalties. You guys know I love a penalty taker. So I have gone back and forth on Alanga versus Gibbs White. But... At the moment, I've got a Langer in there. And then the major omission that people will say, why don't you have this player in there, is actually James Madison. The reason Madison isn't in here is because I can't see a way to get Madison in whilst also leaving the money to get Salah and Haaland in easily in 30 and 31. And I don't want to be forced to make a sacrifice immediately for the likes of a Hyung Min Son in game week 30 just because I haven't given myself a route back to the two best players in the game. So for me, Alanga is worth the sacrifice going for him over James Madison to make it easier for me to get back into the structure that I want. Because what you don't want to be doing in 30 and 31 is taking hits to restructure your team. You, you cannot wildcard and two weeks later be trying to restructure your team. It, it just would be an absolute disaster of a wildcard for me. So I think you need to plan for this and set it up. And Alanga at 5.1 million does that. There are other players you could pick for cheap as well, but I mean, Douglas, Louise and Bailey are two options that also play in 29. But for me, I like the idea of a cheeky punt on a Nottingham Forest midfielder. And at the moment, that is a Langa. So that's the midfield five. Let's move on to the three forwards and then look at what this mystery is above me, which is my transfer plans from game week 29 to 33. So as I alluded to, I don't have Erling Haaland in this draft. And I should have said, I also don't have Mohamed Salah. You could pick either of them on your wildcard this week, but I just don't think that I want either of them this week because I'm finding it very difficult to predict which way that game will go. And you can bring them in in 30 and 31. You can stagger it. I think Salah you would want in 30, Haaland you want in 31. But I don't think you need either this week. And then they, of course, blank in 29. So my, my front three... Whilst it is fairly template, is currently Watkins, Morris, and Solanke. The two that are locked in, if I am to wildcard, are Solanke and Morris because they are the two forwards that are doubling, the two forwards on penalties. And across four fixtures, I would hope that you might get a penalty, maybe even two across from these two, maybe even three or four. You just never know when penalties will happen. They don't happen very often for Bournemouth, I should say. A little bit more common for Luton, but you just never know when they'll happen. And I like the idea of trying to increase my chance. And I've got Palmer, Son, Saka, Morris, and Solanke all on penalties. And I think that is really nice. Maybe I should add Gibbs White in there because I do love a penalty taker. Actually, the only one that's not locked is Ollie Watkins. It's a bit, again, trying to go a bit different to just really maximize the wild card. But I've spoken about this before. A wildcard is differential enough, especially this week. Not many people will be wildcarding. It's different enough to just have all of the players that you want and to sort your team out and to not take a hit. 
I'm not sure that I have to go different for the sake of going different. And Watkins has done damage against Spurs already this season. And it's not a bad fixture. He then has a good fixture in 29 and a good fixture in game week 30. But the reasoning behind potentially not having Watkins, as well as wanting a bit, a bit different and selling a highly owned asset, is Watkins has obviously a good fixture this week, a decent fixture in 29, and a good fixture in 30. But from 31 onwards, Villa's fixtures actually start to turn for the worse a little bit. They're not awful, and they're dotted in there are some okay fixtures. But I think in 31 and 33, he plays against City and Arsenal. In the middle of that, he's got Bournemouth, which could be a good fixture, but no remaining doubles for Aston Villa this season. So at some point, we're going to sell uh, Ollie Watkins unless you want him for a single game in 37. So Watkins is not a season keeper for most people. They will probably sell him. And so why not try and move it forward a bit. I know he's the top scoring player in the game and fixtures are largely irrelevant for him this season. He's been scoring in all of them, but could you go for something like an Ivan Tony? This week, probably an equally okay fixture, probably a slightly better fixture in 29. And then in 30, he plays against Manchester United, which maybe isn't as strong as Watkins. But beyond that, Tony's fixtures are pretty good. The reason that I'm less keen on doing that is I actually think Watkins will be the one that becomes Haaland anyway. So if I go for Tony or I go for Watkins... I think I will move that spot to Erling Haaland regardless. So why not just go for the player that I is just playing incredibly well, has three good fixtures, and has just been so reliable this season. So I, I, I am tempted, I really am, to sell Watkins, but I think I'll probably have him in my final draft. So that is the team. When I look at how much this differs from my current 11, Kaminsky's in, Petrovic, Zabani, Doughty, Kerkes, Udogi, Alanga, Morris, Bowen. So I've made 9 out of 15 of my players have changed. Regarding which players like need to change, I'm gaining obviously 5 doublers this week. I only have 1 at the moment in Solanke. So I'm gaining 10 extra fixtures. That's a lie. I'm getting 5 extra fixtures. Getting 10 from them. But gaining 5 extra fixtures in 28. And then when I look at my 26 team, 29 team, apologies. When I look at my team in blank game week 29, I currently have, I think, 5 or 6, depending on injuries, players. So I'm gaining an extra four or five fixtures in game week 29 as well. So I'm probably gaining nine to 10 extra fixtures and not having to take a hit along with it. And not only am I gaining extra fixtures in 29, I'm also getting better fixtures in 29, right? I, I'm getting rid of the likes of Poro who could be injured. I'm getting rid of Pau Torres and Ariola who I don't think will keep clean sheets. I've got Taylor in there as well. It's not only increasing the number of players I have in 29, but also improving the quality. So there it is. There's the draft for you. Like I said, 13.6 million in the bank. Let's now take a look at what my transfer plans are directly above my head, which will allow this team to start to develop into a slightly stronger team from 30 onwards. So guys, the mystery box above me has been revealed. I just wanted to leave that till the end so that you could see the team and understand my justification before I start showing you the transfer plans. So believe it or not, this team probably won't have 11 in game week 29 and I'm probably taking a hit. And I know I've just gone about, you can save hits and you can field a lot. But you have to sacrifice your team from 30 onwards quite dramatically to field 11 without having to take a hit in 29. Your team just does not look in a good spot. You are looking at having to sell probably Gabriel and Saka. And then you are going into 30 onwards with zero from Liverpool, City and Arsenal. And I'm already going in without City and Ars uh, Liverpool. I don't want to also remove my Arsenal assets as well, particularly. So I think I'm going to probably have to take either a minus four in 29 or field like nine or 10. So let's count them. We've got Kaminsky, Doughty, Son, Bowen, Morris, Watkins, Alanga, and Udogi. So currently, only eight players playing in game week 29. If I make the planned transfers of bringing in Tony and Regulon, that would be 10 for a minus four. And yes, there's not 11, but I would argue that those 10 could even be a wildcard 10. Apart from maybe Kaminsky, you'd have Doughty on a wild card. You'd have Son, Bowen, Morris probably, Watkins, yes, Udogi, Alanga or another Nottingham Forest mid maybe again. So I don't think this team is too far off of what you'll actually see with free hitters. But yes, I will have to take a minus four and no, I won't be fielding 11 players. So Tony and Regulon in for Solanke and Kerkes, taking out two of my Bournemouth, who I know I previously said, could you serve you well from 30 onwards? But I might have to bring Solanke back and if I need him, I'd still have Zabani in the team. So that's the current plan if I go with this team. In game week 30 then, for free, post-international bake, assuming no issues and assuming that Salah is fit around now, Bowen to Salah for free would probably be the move. He's got Newcastle, Salah's got Brighton. I may well captain Salah if he's fit and available. And therefore, I think Bowen to Salah would be nice in 30. In 31, 
That's when I then look to bring Haaland in. And based on the fact that I've left myself 13.6 million in the bank, I should have plenty of money, even with price changes, to do Watkins to Haaland. So by 31, I am going to be in a structure with my team where I've got Saka, Son, Palmer, Haaland, and Salah, and an okay team outside of that. Where I'm then missing is I don't have a third Arsenal. I don't have Darwin, a Liverpool defender. I don't have Foden, a Man City defender. And so I think in 32, I looked at my team, and it actually looks pretty good for 32 if you wildcard like this. And so I don't think you would make a transfer in 32. But then going into 33, you're starting to build towards that bench boost in game week 37. That's when you would need to start loading up on the likes of Man City and Liverpool and maybe bring in a third Arsenal. So I would be looking at Foden. I would be looking at Darwin as well, dependent upon the week. But you can see, for example, in 33, it may be that Son has to be sacrificed for Foden, which allows me to upgrade that Morris spot to Darwin. I know it looks like I have to just carry triple Luton forward from now, but Petrovic will play every game for me or Raya, depending who I go on in goal. Doughty actually has some okay fixtures and he's so attacking, I don't mind playing him. And a lot of the time I can tuck Morris on the bench if I need to. So the team isn't as awful as it might look caring for, but I will again admit that the big con of this wildcard is that from 31 onwards, if you're wildcarding in 31, your team will be much stronger than mine. But I'm hoping that across 28, 29, and maybe even 30, my team might pick up some points. So guys, there you have it. That is my game week 28 wildcard draft. As I said, I've not fully decided if I'm going to play the chip, but if I do, it'll be something along these lines, and I will confirm that in the deadline stream tomorrow morning. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, bye-bye.